right, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kick things off here. Um, thanks everybody so much for joining us tonight. My name is Sean, I'm with North Branch Nature Center. Uh, welcome to our Naturalist Journeys online season. Um, I wanna make a big thank you right up front to all of our sponsors that are making tonight possible and uh, the rest of our Naturalist Journeys online series. So a big thanks to Hunger Mountain Co-op, thanks to Onion River Outdoors, to Union Mutual, to Capital Copy and to Greenvest for, for helping us uh, put this all on. Um, again, if you, uh, if you missed the memo, please keep your microphones off as we uh, go throughout tonight, but throw any questions that you have at any point into the chat bar and I'll moderate those the best as I can um, as, as we're going through. Um, this talk will be recorded so you can find it on our website later on if you have any questions about anything or if there's anything that, uh, that you wanted to dive back into. Um, and, uh, and I'll grab the slides from Joseph as well at some point so that we can, um, uh, so you can have the, the slides available too. Um, so uh, with that, I, um, I uh, learned of Joseph a few months ago on a really great podcast that I listened to called the Ologies Podcast. And I am confident that every single person here would also love that podcast uh, if this is the kind of way you like to spend a Wednesday night. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to bring in somebody we're turning into over to, I know folks are tuning in from all over the country right now, but up here in the Northeast, things are getting cold and about to get snowy. And this is the time of year where we start really focusing in on, uh, on the minute and the small things in nature, especially once the leaves fall off and the birds migrate away and everything. So um, thought it'd be appropriate to uh, focus in on uh, entomology and, uh, and particularly focus in on photography as well. Um, so I wanna uh, thank you, Joseph, for joining us tonight to share your experience and wisdom around all things natural history, entomology, macro photography, and, uh, and yeah, it's a pleasure to have you tonight. Hey, greetings, everyone. Um, first, um, I just wanna say uh, happy Veterans Day if we have any uh, veterans uh, included in our audience tonight. Uh, I myself, I'm an Air Force brat. My mother is a veteran and she put in uh, 24 years herself. Um, with that, carry on and go forward. Let's see, so a bit about me. Um, I'm really a wildlife photographer specializing uh, with arthropods and also uh, reptiles. I started with reptiles um, from the point of basically from, as an extension from uh, my youth. I've always had an interest in reptiles and it just kind of has never gone away. Uh, later on, I got more invested in even smaller things um, like insects, spiders, and so forth. Um, I'm a member of Black AF and STEM. It's an organization that is dedicated to the experiences of Black people uh, in uh, natural spaces. Um, I was a co-organizer co back in June of the first uh, inaugural Black Birders Week. Um, again, just kind of trying to highlight um, underrepresented people within uh, some of these uh, naturalist ho uh, hobbies. Um, some other information here that you can uh, take with you once you can get the, the slides that I will share with uh, Sean like uh, my website, Patreon, um, also a link to the Ologies podcast that he referenced that I did back in July. So I would say I became a naturalist very young. By the age of about five or six, by the time I could read, uh, growing up in San Antonio, um, I was surrounded by these here, these green anoles. This is essentially my spark animal. There you find them on every small bush, small tree on the sides of your houses, and they were accessible to me. One thing that you may not be able to tell or that, that probably wasn't um, included in the advertisement is I'm a paraplegic. So I've, I've been in a wheelchair my entire life. So having these animals accessible to me really kind of helped open up uh, my mind and my interest uh, about the natural world from a very young age. So photography, with, with photography and being a photographer myself, I'm surrounded by, even like within my organization, people uh, with PhDs in uh, ornithology or in conservation and various other things. For me, I'm just kind of the photographer. However, um, even as a photographer, you can really incorporate that and turn yourself and your work into an asset to the natural sciences. Um, when I first started, I used to just take photos of any small insects that I could find, whether it be in my yard or the nearby park, it could be park benches, any location. That, that's one of the great things about arthropods 
is there's no shortage there. Well, um, there, there isn't much of a shortage. They're pretty easy to find. Um, as I became uh, more familiar with them, I learned about their behavior, uh, where they lived, how to kind of find them. If there was something that I was really focused on one, um, the group of animals that I really became focused on was, um, was jumping spiders. And so I sought areas where they were much more abundant. Um, as I was able to get closer to them, not scare them, I understood, you know, how my behavior impacted them. Um, I got, was able to get closer and closer. And as I got closer, I was learning uh, more and more about my photography, my camera, since I was a new photographer at the time. And over time, combining those two things and being able to immerse myself in the natural world and get better as a photographer, improve my photography overall. Here's a few uh, resources um, that you can utilize uh, in helping with the identification and uh, engagement with, um, with citizen science. Um, the, the top one is a guidebook that I have. And this is one of the first ones that um, I helped use and kind of thumbed through it to help me identify what it was that I was actually seeing as I was out looking around at the small world. Bugguide.net is a really great resource. And if you have an internet connection, you're here. So I assume that you do. That is also a really great one. You can type in basic stuff like a green beetle and it will come up with several different uh, images of green beetles. And you can look through that to see what most closely matches what it is that you found. Um, iNaturalist also works the same way. If you're on Facebook, uh, the spider and insect enthusiast group is really good, as well as the insect identification Facebook group. Um, people are really knowledgeable in those groups and they can help you with your identification and learning more about arthropods. Uh, same for Instagram and Twitter. If you have an account with either of those uh, social media platforms uh, through the science communication community, uh, if you get in touch with them, they can really help you out in learning more uh, about what you are finding around you. So one thing that is concerning and one thing that I really hold close to me is um, there are numerous studies that have been coming out of Europe the last several years. Um, and they are telling a very concerning and stark narrative. Um, the, the biomass of arthropods is in decline. Um, in areas, I think, it, I believe it was Germany, um, and that they are showing that the biomass there is declining as much as 75%. That's, for, for me, that's really scary. When you think of insects and arthropods, you understand after plant life, they are really the foundation of a healthy ecosystem. Once they start to decline, you're going to have everything that predates on arthropods and uses them to sustain their lives will also suffer some of the consequences of that. And essentially, the health of these ecosystems will start to fall like dominoes. Um, habitat changes such as deforestation, agricultural developments, um, the draining of wetlands and swamps, pesticides and invasive species, uh, all of these things are contributing to the overall decline of the biomass of arthropods. Um, and one of the thing that, things that inspires me the most is when I hear from people how my photographs have kind of changed the way that they actually look at some of these animals. Oh, I, when they say that I've never seen anything up, uh, up close, this up close and wow, it's actually pretty, look how colorful it is. Or my favorite, of course, because I'm biased towards jumping spiders is, I never thought a, jump, a spider could be cute, but jumping spiders are actually cute because they are, they're cute and they're fuzzy. They're like little eight-legged puppies. Um, and so that's why for me, for macro photography and when I share it with others, um, don't underestimate its ability to influence other people because you can take somebody that is absolutely adamant about destroying any arthropod that they find, be it outside or in their home. And you can teach them the importance of being able to step over or around something when they're outdoors. So to you know, ensuring that it lives 
or if they find something in their house that they catch it humanely and set it outside instead of just destroying it. Also importantly is um, scientists will utilize this information if we share it within bugguide.net or iNaturalist and they use this information, this data to gain ideas about the health of the populations of various species, wherever it is that they're doing research. Um, they use it for other scientific inquiries as well. All right, so now getting into some of the, uh, the gritty, the, the, the technical stuff. So I, I am, I, I accept the fact that I am absolutely what they call in, in photography speak, I'm a gearhead. I love photography gear. It's like Christmas every day, anytime that I'm able to pick up a new camera or lens or something that changes the way that I'm able to approach photography. I enjoy it. I'm guilty, but I accept it. Hey, Joseph, if I can, I just wanted to, to ask you a quick little bit unrelated question, but I, I'm sure other people are wondering too. It sounds like you have tree frogs in the background or something like that. I'm just wondering if that's, if that's the case. You know, I meant to lead with that because y yes, um, those, well, they're not tree frogs. These are dark frogs. If you listen to my ologies podcast, they were running, they, they were chirping all throughout my conversation with Ali Ward then as well. Um, my partner, she keeps about six, six or seven different species of dark frogs and another uh, like six or seven different species of tree frogs as well. The dark frogs by far are the noisiest they chirp all day long. If it's raining outside, forget it. Like you have to turn on music or a movie or anything else to even start to drown them out. Um, I couldn't tell you which one that is off the top of my head. Um, it's sad. I can I can identify every single frog and toad call in the state of Oklahoma by ear, but I can't identify the dart frogs that I cohabitate with on a daily basis. I don't understand it. I haven't been able to close that gap. I, I don't know why. <laughs> um, so going back to um, the photography aspects, if you were an experienced photographer, photographer or brand new, um, these are some of the general settings and it's not specific to, to macro. These are things that I have found that really kind of help as just kind of a baseline that really help. Um, and you can just kind of kind of tweak the, di the, the differences and variation from there. So um, ideally when you do macro, you need a little extra light. So I always use a speed light to actually fill flash because when you're getting up really close to a subject, there's not a whole lot of light in between the end of your lens and your subject. So you need to flash into it to actually f to pull out some of those additional details. Um, with that, it's going to reduce your shutter speed um, so instead of being able to shoot in like one in five hundredths or one in one thousandths like you would if you were shooting, say, birds uh, in, that were moving, um, and I, what I found is that I'm not able to shoot any faster than about one in two hundredths or one in two fiftieths of, of a second. Um, as is kind of standard with photography, you want to keep your ISO as low as possible to reduce the amount of noise or graininess to the photo. Um, and for your aperture selection, this is one of the biggest challenges in macro photography, especially. So your aperture determines what your depth of field is when you're actually taking a shot. So it, another way of putting it is that basically it's going to determine how much of the subject is in focus. So if it's going to be just the eye or if it's going to be more of it. So the higher the number uh, on the f-stop, so like, uh, so like f11, the more of the subject is going to be in focus. The higher the f-stop or the low or the, or the uh the lower the number or the higher the f-stop because the so f like say f 2.8 is the highest it can go so it's kind of inverse low number high aperture because it's actually increasing the size of the window that is actually light is able to penetrate through um so at f 63 it's letting in more light than it would be at f 11 but at F11, more of your subject is going to be in focus. One of the ways that we overcome that in macro photography is through focus stacking. And I will give you guys an example of that uh, later on. 
if you want to stick to just using like a single image and you're not concerned with focus stacking, um, I would probably stay between about F8 and F11. So here's some kind of standard gear just to get you started with uh, macro lenses. Uh, the native systems, I shoot Canon. The first macro lens that I got was 100 millimeter 2.8 L. Uh, Canon also has their flagship 65 millimeter MPE one to five times macro. So at, at its largest magnification, it's five times macro. So um, they boast in their description that at five times macro, it can fill the frame with a single grain of rice. Um, so, so some, in, some impressive magnification. Uh, Nikon has 105 millimeter and Sony has the 90 millimeter. I have a friend who shoots Sony and I give her a hard time just because I'm a Canon guy, but she says um, that these that Sony 90 millimeter, if you shoot Sony is, is about the sharpest lens on the market right now, as far as retaining clarity of the image. And her work is absolutely stunning. Um, Lawa is a Lawa or Venus Optics, uh, another name that it goes by. It's a third party and they specialize in macro optics. And I think I have probably about five different Lawa lenses. I absolutely love them uh, just because of the diversity that you can, you can actually get for the products that they provide. Uh, do realize a lot of their lenses are manual only. So you will have to adjust the aperture by hand or the focus uh, itself by hand. Autofocus basically isn't an option with some of the Lawa options, with some of the Lawa lenses. And is this, for, this is you know, stuff you're, you're talking about like small jumping spiders and that sort of thing. Are you using a different collection of lenses for you know, <clears throat> doing reptiles or something that's a little bit larger of a subject? Yeah, so like with reptiles and I'll, I'll have examples of, of uh, each of these are the different things that I actually have listed here on, on this page with the exception of the last one. The last one I included because um, I know a guy that does this at a moth night that a friend of mine hosts during the summer and he doesn't carry around a camera. He doesn't care to be bothered with, you know, purchasing more equipment. He just got that auto clip lens and he attached it to his cell phone and he's able to get about like two times macro perspective uh, just by using his cell phone. Because only thing that he's concerned about is actually being able to see these things in the wild, record what it is that he sees and share it with whomever shares his interests. And it's absolutely fantastic. Um, so, um, Sean, you kind of lost me there. Um, this got me sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. All, all good. Um, so super macro lenses is basically anything that is greater than your one-to-one -one perspective. For, so for macro, uh, it's defined as a one-to-one -one perspective. So the way that it actually shows up uh, in real life is the way that it would actually show up on the sensor of the camera. So the, like the sensor basically will shrink down an image like a cityscape, and then it projects it. It takes it or it takes something really large and then it shrinks it down so it actually projects it onto the sensor. Um, macro takes that instead of shrinking it down, it actually appears exactly as it is. Um, and then you have two to one and greater, which is even larger. Um, wide angle macro is so much fun. Um, it's my, probably my go to when it comes to reptiles and amphibians. Uh, reason being is that you can include some of the habitat into the photos as well. And it just brings on a whole different life and view and composition to some of the, to, the, to those images. And I've included a couple of examples here. Um, on the left, this is a baby uh, probably hatched that same year, uh, Great Plains rat snake. You can see you have, this was right at, sun, um, at sundown. I couldn't quite get the field behind it because of that uh, rising little bit of a hill. Really wasn't a hill, it was like a tiny little mound really is what it was. I mean, that snake was probably no more than eight inches. And when it was coiled up like that was coiled up about the size of a 50 cent piece. And then we have um, the Texas horn lizard on the right. Um, and I found that this that these uh, images work a little bit better if you can elevate the the subject a little bit, which is why the 
the horn lizard is up on the rock, and then I have that little mound that the the rat snake is on. But you can see, you can see like especially with the uh, the horn lizard, you can see the background, this you know this field, the fence, and these buildings back behind there. <clears throat> So here is one way that uh, before Lawa got involved and there were more and more dedicated uh, macro lenses, some people kind of got around to being able to shoot more, uh, more macro photography. They make this uh, reverse ring mount that basically goes onto the mount of your camera. And with that, you're able to flip whatever uh, lens that you would be using. Like the Canon U often comes with the 1855, excuse me. And um, at about 50 millimeters, you're able to achieve a one-to-one -one macro. But instead of it, you looking out of the usual elements, you're actually looking out, out of what is peering out into the world is the, the lens that would be attaching to your camera. Um, and as, it's, as it says here, you know, with the 24 to 28 millimeters, you can achieve even up to a three times macro perspective with it. Um, the only downside with it is that they are prone to breaking because those, the, the rings themselves aren't all that strong. Um, this is hearsay. I never, I have not used this technique myself. Um, the guy that I learned a lot of macro photography from, he has used it in the past. And a lot of his stuff that it turned out absolutely fantastic. Um, but that was the one thing that he did, he did warn me about was, it is prone to breaking, you may end up going through some lenses, it's probably best to buy cheap lenses in these cases. Um, if this is the direction that you would prefer to go, if you're not sure if macro is for you, and you're kind of wanting just wanting to test it out. A lot of people that have moved on to more serious lenses, uh, still have their old kit lenses that are in the bag that they may not have used in some time. That would be a good one to to practice with. Here's I an use example. These macro uh, rings uh, quite a bit, and and yeah, I, I think the quality you get out of them is really great. But again, because your lens is flipped upside down or flipped backwards, all the copper connections that normal electronics that are normally in the camera are now just to the world, so it's hard to. Um, with the lens attached backwards. So you might want to, yeah, like you're saying, get a dedicated lens. Yeah. Um, and I mean, with Lawa, especially um, the dedicated lenses that they have, while they are manual um, and a little bit trickier to use, they are about half the cost than what you would actually spend with uh, your native systems with Canon, Nikon, or Sony. Um, but I, I did want to include, uh, this is a photo that I used um, from Thomas Shahan, who I learned a lot from. He's also local here to Oklahoma. Um, photo used with his permission. This is a, a mature male Phidippus audac, or Phidippus mustaches. Um, and he, this was taken back in, I think 2000 or 2010. Um, and it was used by the, 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 the method described before with the, uh, the reverse mounts um, to be able to reverse the lenses onto your camera. So it, just to show that it definitely is possible, but this was some years ago, this 10 years ago, and it might be easier and safer, frankly, for all of your equipment to just get a dedicated lens. I see a lot of people that also use this as well. This is not, this is um, a, a, a kit that I don't have experience with, um, the Raynox. It is a basically a universal clip-on lens that will magnify um, these subjects two and a half, up to two and a half times, or actually it's a fixed two and a half times magnification. So if you have a hundred millimeter uh, lens, uh, macro lens, and it's one to one, you're going to be shooting at about three and a half times magnification with the Raynox attached to it. Um, some of the things that to consider is that anything that you add on to your lens for the most part is going to reduce the overall image quality some. And now whether it's detectable by, you know, your average person, it may not be. Um, I, I've seen amazing results uh, using this. Uh, it's just not one that I have pursued myself. I, I prefer to use, um, just the native lenses or the locked-in lenses that are actually dedicated for whatever mag uh, magnification purposes 
um, of that specific lens. Um, the other benefit is, is that it's relatively cheap. You know, you can get, you can add this to any lens that you have uh, for less than a hundred bucks. All right, so <clears throat> I mentioned uh, Flash before, and I use Flash in everything I do when it comes to macro photography of some sort, um, whether it be speed light. In some cases, I'll, I'll also use some assistance with uh, constant light as well. Um, because Robert Fly, um, I shot at night, and so there was no additional lights around it anyway, with the exception of the flash that I use as, um, to, to illuminate the the robber fly um, across macro photographers it's it's almost like a contest of kind of who can create the best uh, light diffusion with uh, uh, do-it-yourself projects um, and I created an example here as far as to understand the kind of the the value so I took three photos uh, with the way that I set up my light diffusion one was on the furthest left no light diffusion whatsoever. This is just the speed light onto these shiny metallic looking beads. And you can see like, you know, how you get this, the light just bounces off of it. It doesn't really absorb the light very well. This harsh lighting and this hot spot here in the, in the middle of the beads. Um, this one was with one diffusing element and you know, I'll show you on my camera. So on my camera, this, so this, the middle photo I put a piece of foam just directly over the speed light and the middle photo was the result that I got. The last one, and this is what I use for all my regular photography is I have this diffusion element and then I have this diffusion elements, another piece of foam that is fitted over the barrel. So I just basically, in order to do this, I just took square pieces of foam and cut it so that it's angled and traced around the barrel of the lens to kind of size up as far as how large that hole needed to be. And on the un underside here, you can see that it, this is actually split all the way through and I've attached these little rubber pieces to it. And this uh, in the middle here is elastic. So this stretches, and this is how I'm able to actually slide it on and off of the, the lens. Now, the reason that I, cut the uh, the foam so is it, you can see in the third photo the way that that kind of bows a little bit and so it creates a little bit more of a kind of a natural uh it's almost like basically like a catch light if you think of like cartoons and animation uh there's always a catch light in the subject's eyes depending on you know how they're looking or where they're looking this is really effective actually, and it's, it's pretty helpful to create these catch lights, especially when you're shooting jumping spiders because they have such big interior median eyes and you can create, you can essentially with your flash diffusion place this, uh, that catch light that makes them a little, even more inviting and almost more hu you know, humanizing them than, than what they really already are. So <clears throat> there's some other ways too that you can also get um, some light diffusion. Um, you can do speed light soft boxes, which I do have one for other work. Um, you can buy these online and they just, again, with Velcro, they just fit over the top of your speed light. These really come in handy, especially when I'm shooting reptiles and amphibians. Um, and particularly when I am shooting wide angle macro, because what will happen is if I shoot, if I, if I photograph them with the speed light on the camera, the soft box itself will actually fall down and will end up being in the frame because of that wide, that wide angle. So what I do instead is that I have the, I have this attached to a, a tripod, a small tripod. So I'm able to actually shoot away from my camera and then I'm able to actually get the whole element outside of the frame of view and get, you know, and I'm able to compose the shot a lot easier that way. You don't have the flash inside of that diffuser. That's just, that's just reflecting 
the speed light. Is that right? Which are you talking about? The the one the I one, have here. Yeah, in the tripod. You you don't have your speed light inside that, or do you? Yeah. Oh, you do. Okay. No. Yeah. They have the speed lights in here. So the speed lights here, and then the, the the diffuser is over the speed light. And then again, like with this, it's since it has a tripod, I'm able to kind of set this down away from the subject and away from the camera. And you know, you move it around or whatever, and so you get the desired effect that you want with the shadows and the lighting. Make sure that the eye is always well lit and sharp. Um, and I, I've got much better results with that, although I haven't put as much use of that. I just started doing that this year um, with my uh, wide angle macro. And one person is wondering if you uh, have any experience using um, uh, flash rings, a ring flash. I don't like them. Um, I don't have experience with them and I stayed away from them intentionally because of the results that I saw. Um, I, when you shoot something where their eyes are prominent, and again, since I shoot so many jumping spiders, what you end up with instead of the catch light that actually, like I said, kind of looks like almost like animation, what you end up with is a reflection of this ring in the center of their eye. And that looks really unnatural and odd to me. And that, that's just my own personal bias. It still creates some wonderful effects and it does create nice lighting. I just don't like the ring in the eye. That's just, that's just Joseph. If, if, if that is something that you want to go with, have at it. Um, you can still create really good results, uh, really nice lighting, really nice soft light. Um, I included a photo of, there's this guy, his name is Peng Wei. Um, and he has created a bit of a craze. He's the first one that I realized had created essentially this style of diffuser to where what it does ultimately is it, it fits over the speed light, as you can see, and it almost basically covers the subject of whatever it is that you're going to photograph. And it blocks out all of the external light. And so the only light that you get is based off of his flash and his diffuser. It creates amazing photographs because he has complete and total control over the lighting. Basically, it's like a mobile studio, a mobile studio for a macro photographer. Um, I'm not that handy. <clears throat> I'm not that good at building stuff. So I've I tried to duplicate this myself and failed miserably. And I also found it really difficult and cumbersome to carry around something that took up that much space, especially like if you're trying to shoot something that is on like a tree limb or it's inside of a bush or something somewhere, it's the, the, the light diffuser itself is going to move it out of the way and disturb the entire scene. And you may not get the shot of the animal. And I just couldn't, I, I couldn't find my own personal balance with, with that type, which is why I defaulted to uh, what I showed you with the foam over the, the speed light and on the, the barrel. Um, but if you are handy and you want to try to duplicate something like that, have at it, more power to you. If you figure out a really easy way, relay it back to me, to Sean and maybe to me and I, I might give that another go. Um, you can even purchase these as well. He's actually gone to where um, he's able, he builds them and he ships them internationally. There's another one might be easier to remember called the Beetle Diffuser. Um, I think it's a fellow his, he, who is out in India and it's a very similar um, product as this. Um, also produces incredible results. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's available to you if that's the direction that you actually wanted to go. For me, it's, for me, it's more about being outdoors and being engaged and immersed with the wildlife than it is about getting all my light perfect. But I mean, I, I, I will absolutely admit that this uh, setup is a better system of light diffusion than what I do. So I do a little bit more post-processing, you know, through software to kind of close that gap a little bit. So when you get, you know, all of those things kind of aligned, you've learned your camera, you've gotten comfortable with the macro lens that you're, you're using, you have figured out a way to diffuse light that you enjoy and it works for you. Um, you carry on and you're able to get some pretty nice photos. This is uh, one of my partners, uh, Highland 
Highland Bronze Dart Frogs. Um, I shot this literally in the cage one day. I just saw it sitting there. I was like, oh, that's you know a really pretty little setup. And my camera was nearby, I grabbed it, took the photo. And what really kind of stood out about it was accidental because of the shape of the um, of the plant itself, and because of that little bit of water that's in the bottom of it. It almost acted like it's uh, its own reflected. It reflected the the flash that went into it and it illuminated it further. That's why you know the frog is so much brighter than the area around it. And it wasn't anything that I did. It was just the situation, and I was able to take advantage of it. Uh, last October, I met up with a friend of mine in uh, Missouri, and they were going out looking for salamanders. And here in Oklahoma. I'm in central Oklahoma, so I have to travel all the way to the Washita Mountains, almost to Arkansas, to find any good diversity and uh, abundance of salamanders. Um, my brother was getting married in Illinois, and then I was picking up my oldest brother in Missouri. His flight was delayed, and so I went and met with this friend who was going salamandering, and we found dozens um, of these cave salamanders, ring salamanders, and some others literally just walking across the roads. We were sitting on the grounds photographing one, and we would have another three, four, or a half a dozen walking by us at the same time. And it, it was the, one of the most incredible experiences that I've, actually, that I've had as a photographer. Maybe I'll talk about this, uh, Joseph, but I'm wondering if you, in the case of like salamanders or insects, um, if you are just photographing them as is in sight, or if you're bringing them into like a little, you know, nature studio that you've set up for them. I do a little bit of both. Um, and um, I've got an example that I'll be sharing with everyone here in a little bit, kind of what my in-home studio looks like and how my in-home studio, I, I use the word studio very, very lightly. It, it's, it's not fancy. It's pretty bare bones, but I, I, what I do when I'm outdoors is I try to duplicate that as much as I can um, to try to create some kind of like specific scenarios that, uh, that just that improve uh, photographs a little bit. Um, here's another photo. It was this is the same Texas one lizard that I had the photograph earlier of it standing on the rock. Um, just a different lens, the macro lens instead of the wide angle. This is my 100 millimeter. So I got a lot closer to uh, to him and you know got a nice profile of his of his face. All right, so now I'll kind of lead you. In, uh, I'll show you what I do when I'm in the home. And give me just a second to set up here. All right, so um, I saw a couple of folks that had come in a little bit late. So this is what I carry around with me when I'm shooting macro photography. Um, camera, lens, foam over the lens, and then foam also over the speed light. It softens it a little bit here. This helps, dis um, this piece over the, the lens itself helps distribute that light over a wider plane, which helps soften that light up quite a bit. Um, what I do while I'm at home, say I have if I've caught um, a jumping spider that is of interest to an arachnologist and they need a specimen that I need to actually send it, I'll catch it for them. I'll take my photographs for my own selfish interests and then I'll send it over to them. Um, but since I have it, I try to create essentially a, uh, a more controlled environment. I'm going to just do this by hand and try to guide along. So forgive me if this is there, there are some strange things going on with the camera here. So this is actually what I used for that example of the flash earlier. I was gonna to try to use it actually for the background, but it didn't work out in this uh, example that I'll continue on with. Um, I got a really cool tip recently watching a, a YouTube video of a guy that does some of his work on this Lazy Susan. And I was like, that is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to take that and use that for myself. So a lot of times you'll create the scene and you'll just go outside, pick up some bark and some leaves if you want to create like a little bit of a, an autumn feel like this stuff here. And I put a jumping spider here. You kind of just watch them a little bit. They'll crawl around underneath and eventually settle down. 
if you don't do that and you just put them on this bare thing, they feel exposed and vulnerable and they just run away. You know, um, the, the benefit to the lazy Susan is you don't ever have to touch the spider, which is really beneficial because they don't have skeletons and bones. And if you move too fast, you may injure the spider and that's not fun. It makes me sad. I have done it uh, in the years that I've been shooting and this was a really great solution. So if the spider is being uncooperative and it keeps wanting to face on the opposite direction, you just spin this and readjust your camera and you're still good to go. Um, also, I keep uh, this small lamp just in case you need a little extra light. If I'm shooting at really high magnification, uh, anything above about two times macro, very little light gets into the barrel of the lens. Um, so added light, uh, like coming from the lamp onto the subject really helps out a lot. Um, ideally, what you want to do is if you have a color um, in mind that you want for the background, put it behind the scene and you want to create a little bit of distance behind that. So like if um, I'll go back and I'll, I'll show an example of this to make that simpler of what I mean. You, so you would want to move something forward close to this, have something that's a little bit elevated and higher back here. And that way, whatever is in your background, that's what the color of the background of the photograph is going to be. And I'll show you what I mean with that. Okay, I'm gonna go back to that. So as far as like backgrounds, um, so like this salamander, what I did to create that yellow and green um, background is th those are just the leaves that were falling around. And so I just placed them a little bit further behind the salamander. The further back you place them, uh, the more blurred out they're going to be. The closer they are, the, the, you know, the more in focus they're going to be. You don't want them to be in focus. You just want them to kind of help out um, and create you know, that nice creamy back or bokeh. Can you guys still hear me? We can hear you, but we lost your webcam. Okay, I was gonna say, I thought I saw something that just happened. Let me see if I can get that back. Well, you can still see my screen for now, right? Yep, yeah, screen's good. Okay. What's important at the moment, I guess, is to see the screen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you, you all through a, uh, a series of photographs that I took uh, last night and this morning of a Phytopus audax that lives in my house. Um, so with all the fruit flies that uh, my partner feeds, her, uh, her dart frogs and the tree frogs, um, there's never a lack of abundance of them. There's, there's unfortunately no way to perfect making sure that they all get eaten and only in the cages. So there's always a few stra uh, stragglers or fruit flies around. The way that I have combated that is I catch these very abundant and very prolific and uh, it, these, these Phytopisodax and I just release them in the house and they keep the fly population down. And since all of her frog tanks are on timers for sprinklers and everything else, they have access to water, they have access to food, they may even have access to a mate if I, you know, if I release a pair in the house at some point, which I'm sure has happened. They find their way out of the house too all the time. So but it's kind of a recurring thing. So I take my photos and um, the way that I do this, I one thing that I didn't include earlier is when it comes to the settings is I always shoot on high speed continuous if I'm going to shoot a focus stack. And that's in your drive mode for your camera. So you can set your drive mode to a single shot to low speed continuous or high speed continuous. Set it to high speed continuous because you want it to shoot as quickly as possible because you only have a little bit of time while your subject is sitting still. And you want to get as many of those photos and as much depth into that photo as you can. Um, so if you look at the series, you see on this one, it's only this, this leg right here, this front leg that is actually in focus. This is what's sharp. None of the face is in focus. This is the challenge of macro photography. How are we going to get all of this information uh, into a nice sharp photo? And if you look at the, the back, rather even this one, you see that its right eye is actually sharp and in focus here. So the way that you can combat this is you will select all of them, shift select all, X, when you go to export, and I'm using Lightroom, 
Um, go to your file settings here. Make sure that the image format is an original. This is an important part. I did not do this for a long time, and I ended up losing a lot of information and a lot of image quality in a lot of my older photos because I did not know this part. So I shoot in RAW in camera. I don't shoot JPEG. When you shoot raw, you take in the most amount of the most information possible. It also gives you the greatest range to be able to edit your photo in post production as possible as well. After I've selected original uh, for the image format I, and the um, the folder, I, I keep a folder on the C drive to make it make sure that it's as fast as possible. I labeled it focus stack because this is all I do for this uh, for this process. And then I will export them. I think I've already I think I already did this earlier so yeah. So I have them all here already in my focus stack folder that is on the C drive to make sure that everything runs fast. If you have an external hard drive um, and you set it to your external hard drive it's going to take a lot longer for it actually to save all of that to you since so for me, it's just a matter of just kind of speed and efficiency to keep this on the, the main drive. Now, once they're here, I go and I open up Photoshop. And so to start a focus stack, I go to File, glide down to Scripts. And from scripts, I go to load files into stack. Now I have all this written down on one of the slides. You're feel free to take you know, you know your notes um, as, as much notes as you want. But I, for me, if I can read it and then refer back to it, it's always been helpful. So I did that for you guys preemptively as well. Um, and this pop-up will come up, you go browse. And you want to go to where you have your file, your images stored. Shift select all of those, click OK. They all load in here. Click OK again. And then you wait while Photoshop does its thing. While we're waiting, I had a quick question for you, Joseph, about um, when you actually do take this this stack here, are yep. you um, on a tripod moving your focus ring? Are you leaning in and out? Are you, um, are you using a macro rail? How do you go about actually getting the entire series of images? That's a really good question. Um, I wish I had included that already. I'm glad you asked. OK, so. Um, I do not use a rail. I, if you read, if you if you Google any article, there are almost like nine out of 10, 10 will say you have to use a focus rail. No, not necessarily. Um, so I have, I came up with an analogy that I thought of. If you've ever, if you've ever played pool, the way that you actually use the pool stick, uh, you know, you have it in your non-dominant, at least for me, is in my non-dominant hand. And then I'm embracing it and stabilizing it with my dominant hand. And I'm using that pull stick to glide forward and backward. And that's what I basically do with my camera. Um, flip that, though, because I'm using my dominant hands when I'm actually using my, hammer, my, my camera. And I'll use my non-dominant hands to either rest on the table that's close by. So I'll set my camera lens onto my hands. And that essentially acts as the rail. And it gives me full control over the camera. And I can move it wherever I need to. Because a live animal is not going to stay still. The, the rail is really good if you're going to do a really deep focus stack. And deep focus stack meaning you're going to do about 100, 150 photos of a really small pinned insect. It creates some wonderful imagery. I don't have the patience for it, and I'm more interested in live animals anyway. Um, so unfortunately, I'm, I'm not the expert when it comes to really deep focus stacks. Most of mine are anywhere from about three to maybe about a dozen photos, depending on how cooperative uh, my subject is. That Did that make sense? Yeah, perfect, thanks. All right, so once all the photos are loaded into Photoshop, you'll shift select all. I 
after you've gotten them all selected, you come up to edit in that top bar here, slide down to auto align layers. And then this pop-up screen will come up and it has all of these different styles of alignment. I just use auto. Um, and all this does is that it, it aligns all of those photos so that your subject is in the best alignments that the software can provide for you. So you see in these corners how it's kind of, it's changed the way that it overlaps a little bit. This is essentially correcting some of my errors that I've done in hand. And it's making sure that the spider is overlaying on top of itself um, as close as possible. That's why you have, like, again, that's why the, the, these little jagged areas. And this stuff will go away once you go back to edit. And then you glide down and you select auto blend layers. And it will show you two options, panorama. We're not doing a panorama like a large landscape. Um, we just do the stack image second option. Click OK. And you wait a little bit. And now Photoshop has taken all of those photos and it's taken all of the most amount, the greatest amount of sharp detail, like in each of these legs, the eyes, the chelicerae, the pedipalps, even some of the tufts on the hair, some of these details on the legs on the, uh, the hair on the legs. And it's merged them all into one single image. So now instead of going back to, uh, so this is one of the photos that we were actually utilizing. See, it's just the leg that's actually in focus here. And that's just one of the things that comes with the territory of macro photography. You have to pick and choose. It was either, if I'm going to take one shot, you always want to make sure it's the eyes at least. And so if I was going to just be one shot, it would be this one. But of course, this front leg is not in focus. And then you go back over to Photoshop and after you've stacked it, this leg is in focus, the eyes are in focus. So much more of your subject is in focus there. From here, I once it, I, I'm pleased with the image that it renders and it doesn't work perfectly every time. Sometimes you have to go back and you have to delete some of the photos um, that may be too off on too far off on the alignments in Lightroom and restack it. Um, and you, that's just one of those things that comes with practice. You'll kind of start to recognize you do more of it. You'll have, you know, if, if in this photo, if your placements of this photo of the spider is here, kind of nice and centered, but one of them is over in the top right, probably don't want to keep the one that's in the top right. You want to aim for keeping as many of them centered as possible. That's where your best chances of a good alignment is. Um, Photoshop can't do everything for it. You kind of have to give it the best, uh, you know, the, the best stuff that you can give it to be able to work with. Um, it's back to Photoshop with the final image. Go to file. I save all of mine as a TIFF file. And we'll do, you guys are in, sit in Vermont. So this is a Vermont Audax now. And I'm going to save it back to my focus stack folder. And so this uh, pop-up will come up and you want to make sure that the image compression is highlighted on none. You don't want any compression. You want as much information as you can retain from this photo as possible. Click OK. Wait a few seconds. Watch the percentage. That's done. And then I go back over to, for, you, you can do it however you want, whatever um, you're most comfortable with in terms of editing photos. I first learned to edit photos for exposure and details in Lightroom, so I prefer Lightroom. Um, so I would go back and all of these photos are still saved on my hard drive. So I'm going to remove these real quick since I'm done with stacking them. Then I'm going to go back to file 
import photos and video. I save this to the main drive and it's in focus stack. And it's this one here. I don't want to I don't need to import those again. I just want to import this image that we stacked in Photoshop. And from here, it's just a matter of what you want to do. For me, I, I, I feel like post-processing is really uh, a very uh, subjective thing. Um, there, there are some kind of standard process, uh, standard practices in photography. You know, uh, one thing that I always learn and that I always do is that you want to create the most space in the direction that your subject is looking. So I might crop, crop down that left side a little bit to create some of that space. It also helps enlarge the spider a little bit uh, as far as your view there. Um, and I like to change the any any parts of the exposure on this graph here and you can darken it, bring up the highlights, the, the whites of, of those legs a little bit. Now, I'm shooting on a new camera with this one, and I'm pretty pleased with the amount of sharpness that that there is here around the eyes. This one is still a little bit soft, but considering the amount of detail that we have, that's that's pretty okay still. Um, I think a perfect example, you would actually have all four of these, um, these eyes up in the, in the front of its face would all be sharp from here to this side. And even probably like this tuft of hair, if I was being a real perfectionist and real stickler about it, that would be my goal with uh, with this image. Um, um, just a few questions for you. Yes, sir. Um, one is, well, I'm wondering if, if, uh, if these are all like F between F8 and F11, each one of these in the stack, or if you're at something else. All the, they're all the same exposure. So, you know, once you actually hit the shutter and you're, you're high speed continuous, it's, it's what you set it at from there. So um, I can go up here and it, it'll tell you. So if you look up here, it was an ISO 640, 100 millimeters, F7.1, one in 200 seconds. And then um, uh, Mark is wondering uh, how much movement is there between each one of these images in the stack? Are we talking like you're sliding the camera a millimeter, a centimeter, an inch? Like, I, I honestly could not even begin to, to measure that. I mean, it is, it, it is micro. It is, uh, I, I, you, what I do is I shoot in manual. I do not shoot it in autofocus when I do macro. So I will, I will get as close as I can and I'll get to the whatever is closest. So the closest uh, part of the subject in this frame is going to be that front right leg. And so from that front right leg, that's when I press the shutter. And as I press the shutter, I just lean in further and further until it gets um, back behind the eyes is what I, what I go for. Um, I had, by the time that I had gotten there, the spider had actually pivoted to his left a little bit. And so I lost any chance of that one. So I was left with what I had here. Otherwise I could have gotten that other, uh, that other, um, the other eye and the other side of its face in a little bit sharper focus. Um, got a couple other questions as well. I know we're, we're closing in. Well, actually now we're beyond closing on the eight o'clock and we can keep going, but I want to just make sure some of the earlier questions that we had, we get answered in case those folks have to split. Um, uh, so one, one question was, um, uh, what, well, one is why, uh, is there a reason that you use tips instead of high resolution JPEGs? What's your, what's your reasoning for using tip at the, at the end? Um, tips are, they, they contain a massive amount of data. So if you want to, if you want to print at like 300 DPI, um, it, it's a lot easier to actually hit that mark if you are using TIFF files rather than JPEGs. Um, let me see if I can go back to go back to this. So, for example, like this. Um, Whoa. That st stack photo, six hundred nine megabytes as a TIFF file. 
Now, if I converted that from Lightroom to a high resolution JPEG, uh, that's going to drop down to somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 megabytes. So, you know, the difference being is that, you know, even with the 20 megabytes, you can still, you can print like a 16 by 20 image of this writer and it would look fantastic. If I wanted to print something that I could cover an entire wall with, I would, I, I would use the TIFF file instead. So when you go and buy your macro lens, make sure you buy a new computer also. And uh, Annette's wondering um, if you have to worry at all about um, camera shake and handshake when you're taking these stacks. Um, so that's why I use uh, my non-dominant hand to rest uh, the, the camera lens on. It helps with some of that shake. I, I rarely ever shoot with the camera in the air or if holding onto it with two hands. So like one, um, being a paraplegic, my seating balance isn't quite as strong as uh, an able-bodied person in most cases. So I'll often use, you know, my left arm to kind of help prop not only myself, but also the camera up on as well. So I'm helping control both things, you know, my, my body and the, and the, the camera. Um, and so I'm kind of like, just like the way that you would glide a pull stick in for, you know, the contact with the, the cue ball, you're kind of just moving in with your camera lens until you get from your closest point to the furthest point uh, in the, your uh, on your subject that you want to get to and that they'll allow you to get because they don't sit still. Um, and Tracy was wondering uh, a little while ago, um, the question was, what do you, what equipment do you carry into the field with you? And basically wondering if uh, the setup that you showed us, if that's the entirety of what you're bringing into the field with you, um, or if there's other, other stuff that you, you know, you have around you as well. Um, so it depends on what I'm doing for the day. I, I, I shoot a lot of stuff. If you look at uh, my Instagram or my website, I shoot birds reptiles. I've even shot a few mammals this year, which is shocking to me anyway. Um, so get, given some of my mobility limitations, I kind of pick one for the day. You know, if I'm shooting birds, I'm focused on birds for the day. Um, if I am doing macro photography, yeah, what, what you have seen here uh, is basically what I carry with me into the field. It's just um, that camera. I'll usually pick a particular lens for that day. Sometimes I'll carry um, one extra lens with me, uh, like my two and a half to five times macro if I find something really small. And that way I can change lenses and focus on that. Um, but other than that, it is just uh, the camera, speed light, lens, and light diffusion element. That's, that's the basic bare bones of it. And it also makes it the easiest to get through, you know, fields and trails and everything else. You know, the less you have to carry with you, the further you can go, the more you can find. I think anyway. Um, just so you know, we can't see your your uh, your video still knocked off. I think just trying to remedy that, and it is not cooperating with me very well. Okay. Because it's showing me that the video is still running, but I'm getting the blue circle of death right now, and it's just spinning and not allowing me to control anything on the actual Zoom, uh, the Zoom link. So well, I apologize okay, for that. we can hear you just fine. And the screen share is working. So um, let's see. Um, I think that's probably most of the questions um, for now. I'm looking through. Um, uh, Brian had a question about Brian. I don't know if Brian already uh, uh, hopped off the call, but wondering about your method for the question is, um, does Joseph have a method he likes for color balance other than the standard Lightroom choices? I do not. Um, I, I really have not gotten into um, any of the, the weeds on, on that kind of stuff. I, I kind of just, I tinker around with it until I get something that I think is best represents what I know that animal to look like. Uh, Tracy is saying that maybe we need a follow-up session. I think that sounds like a great idea. We should get together again and... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, do macro photography round two. You know, um, maybe <laughs> one of these days, if I actually develop the patience for good, doing like really deep stacks, um, I, I would I would be happy to do it again. Um, the what the one point that I did want to leave with you, and unfortunately, I don't have the the visual to kind of go along with it, 
is th the last slide that I have was basically with some of the first photos that I started off with, and they were terrible. Um, you know, be patient with yourselves. If I had known everything, that, even that I had demonstrated uh, in this last hour, uh, if I had known that to begin with, I would have been able to get to where I am today a lot faster. So don't be hard on yourselves, give yourselves time and um, also keep front and center. The most important thing is that these are tiny animals that do a whole lot for the planet and the health of ecosystems. And they don't have much of any kind of defense uh, toward the things that are going on around the world. So, you know, it, it's up to us to help protect them and defend them and to hopefully make the the general population see arthropods in a in the light that shows just how valuable they are to the world. I'm going to take the liberty of uh, sharing my screen since I can. Let's see. Am I sharing the right one? Yeah. Um, I'm sharing. I don't know if you can see it, Joseph, but I'm sharing your website. Um, um, I want to encourage folks to go over to Joseph's website, uh, paraherpetologica.com. Um, you can check out his um, his galleries, prints for sale, arachnids, amphibians, insects, reptiles, all sorts of great things. So um, so definitely be sure to go check him out there. If you use Instagram, it's um, uh, his handles at Reels on Wheels. And um, there's a couple other questions that folks have, but uh, since folks, some folks are tuning out, I just want to take a quick moment to um, thank all of our sponsors one more time for making tonight possible and uh, our future naturalist journeys presentation. So thanks Hunger Mountain Co-op, An In River Outdoors, Union Mutual, Green Vest, Capital Copy. Um, so thanks to all those folks. Um, if you live in the Montpelier area, please uh, give them some business. And if you're uh, tuning into the North Branch Nature Center programming for the first time, we're really psyched to have you. And, uh, and we'll get together again and do some more, uh, chat more about macro photography at some point, I promise. Um, but Joseph, are you okay if we ask some more uh, questions and, and chat a little bit more since it seems like we can at least hear mm -hmm. you just fine? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything going on. So <laughs> br bring on the questions. All right, cool. Um, oh, one person is uh, asking me uh, where the recording is going to be. And if you go to northbranchnaturecenter.org under natural history programs, right on our main uh, website uh, navigation bar, you'll see uh, our presentations links. So all of our presentations recordings will be available there. Um, it'll give me a day or two to get this uh, turned around and up there and, and I will, I'll chop out as much of the technological issues as I, as I can. Um, let's see. Um, Elizabeth is uh, asking you, Joseph, if you could, if you have any written directions for uh, focus stacking. Yes, they're they're in the uh, the slide deck, and I will make sure that you get that, Sean. So um, okay, we ended on a slide that said demonstration, and then immediately after that, I have a written demonstration that literally goes step by step of each of the things that I did between Lightroom to Photoshop and back to Lightroom. Okay, super. I'll, uh, folks, I'll put that slide deck um, uh, next, right beneath the recording. So if you find the recording, um, you know, embedded, you know, video window, the PDF of the slides will be right there below it. So you can access both together. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, so a while ago, Sandra was wondering if you have any experience with um, like the twin flashes um, that some people use mounted on their lenses. Do you think that's kind of the same story as using a ring flash where you just get strange, strange catch lights? No, actually. So I think the, I think twin flash honestly is probably the best option overall. Um, I have one. Um, I just find it really, it's, it's a larger piece of equipment than the speed light. Um, it's a little bit more cumbersome and creating the light diffusion. You, now you have, you have the, um, the challenge of creating light diffusion for both of the flashes um, as opposed to just the one. It's a little harder to carry around in the field. And what I have found with mine, so I, Canon makes one that is outrageously expensive. Um, I had picked up one that I think is also created by Lawa, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the issue that I have with it is that it doesn't, um, so on, on my camera with the speed light, when I turn on my camera, and then I turn on my speed light when I'm looking at the live view uh, function, which I also shoot everything in, in live view. 
I don't use the viewfinder, the eyepiece when I'm shooting macro photography at all. Um, so in live view, when I have my speed light, the, the live view will light up really nicely so I can actually see where I'm going and I can actually find my subject. When I use the twin flashes, it doesn't light up nearly as strongly and I have to change the exposure. I have to overexpose essentially to find where I'm going. And then I would have to change the exposure back down to get the appropriate exposure when I'm taking the photos. And I just, I found that a little bit more challenging. So I just kind of defaulted to using my speed light more. But uh, again, I think the twin flash actually produces probably the best result when it comes to the overall quality of the lighting in the photo. And are you using a Canon brand speed light, the 430EX or the 580EX? Um, I am not. Um, on lighting, that's where I'm a bit cheap. Um, it's uh, Young Now, I think it's the 630 or something along those lines. And I've had this for three years and I haven't had any malfunctions in it. And um, when you are, when you're shooting high speed continuous and it is synced with a flash, you're talking about a lot of flashes, a lot of heat, a lot of power output, and it's been able to keep up with all of it. So. Um, Rachel's wondering how you approach flighty insects with the macro lens. Um, oh, man. Zoom, use a zoom lens and stay farther away or how do you handle um, those tricky insects? Um, lots of expletives and patience. <laughs> um, th there are some of them that just simply don't cooperate. If they're flighty, they are flighty. It's you have to kind of learn animal behavior in the process and see how, how quickly uh, you can approach, which is generally very, very slowly, really. Um, and you hope for the best. And if they fly away, there's really nothing you can do about it. You just hope that you get another shot at the same subject and you just go find something else. Are jumping spiders a little more cooperative for that reason? They can't fly. I mean, they can jump, but. <laughs> it, you know, it depends. You know, the, the behavior of different varies among species. You know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, the Phytopus audax, the one that we use the example, the, the common name is the bold jumping spider. I don't find them to be very bold at all. Like anytime I get close to them, they are one of the fastest to get underneath something away from you. They, 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 they get away. Now, um, at the end of that slide deck, um, what I had used as an example of showing kind of where I started to where I am today is the, um, uh, the Pellegrina Provaga. And those guys will literally just stare at you and they will give you their best side. And then the other side, if you want that to, just completely cooperative almost like 90 percent of the time um so it, it's just a matter of really kind of getting in the field and that's why it's i i kind of stress you know the importance of being a naturalist first you know learn your insects and then learn how to engage them and once you've learned how to engage them then you will better learn how to photograph them cool uh, if anyone has any other questions, now's a good time to, <laughs> Tracy's saying the key is to bring some bait to get them to slow down um, mm -hmm. or hover. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. You know, when we do like hummingbird photography, for instance, right, notoriously flighty little thing, setting up your own little studio um, so that you have a reasonable, you can reasonably guess where that bird's going to be by bringing in a bunch of feeders, surrounding the feeders with flowers. You can set up a little, you know, you can use, if you lead as a naturalist, like you're saying, Joseph, you can kind of um, kind of uh, predict some behaviors and, and set yourself up in the right places uh, accordingly. Um, also, like if you do find, um, like you said, leading as a naturalist, um, most, especially like predatory animals, they, they are highly motivated by food. I mean, you said the same thing essentially with the hummingbirds. Um, one of the, the best photos that I was able to get uh, of a tiger beetle um, was a day that they were just there there was an absolute buffet of these really small dipterids a type of fly i i suspected and they were all over the sidewalk and so they were really easy to get to and they were much more concerned with eating than they were with my presence and you you exploit those moments to get your photograph um, Joseph, is there are there any um, places you want to point folks to? Any um, anything you want to promote, push your website? Anything um, good resources, whatever you want. I want to give you the last word here before we sign off. Um, well, so you showed them my website, uh, Reels on Wheels Instagram. Um, I do also have a Patreon. If you would like to uh, support my endeavors there, I 
I really appreciate, I have really, really appreciated anybody that has chosen to, to support me through Patreon. Um, you can pledge whatever, as little or as much as you like. Um, um, also, Black AF and STEM, the organization that I'm helping support, which helps uh, bring a little more light and experience to underrepresented demographics. Um, myself as both a Black uh, person of color and a disabled person. Um, you know, these things are important to me to be able to get uh, more people like me that are that are like me into uh, natural spaces because you know nature is for all of us. I would uh, say it literally, like it literally <laughs> just I don't know what just happened, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take advantage of it real quick. Okay, sounds good. So here's the example that I was talking about. This is the same species of spider, Pellegrino parvaga. They're very charming. They are not at all afraid of me when I approach. It seems like they, they will happily just sit and stare. Um, several years ago, the photo on the left, this is the best quality work that I was able to achieve at that time. Um, through that there is barely any light diffusion in that photo. I think I actually have like this little piece of plastic that covered the kit flash on the, the or the actual, the in-camera flash. I didn't have a speed light or anything. And then the photo on the right is one that I took this spring. Um, so, you know, allow your time, allow yourself time to, to progress. Definitely. And uh, yeah, I will uh, echo what Chris just said. Thank you so much, Joseph, for sharing your artwork with us and your, uh, your skills and your expertise. And um, it's a pleasure to bring you virtually up to Vermont and uh, to visit you in Oklahoma. And thank you again. Hey, glad to be here. I'm, I appreciate uh, you guys giving me an audience tonight.